Thanks for coming out on a Friday morning. You guys are the true diehards. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm Scott Barnwell. I work with the city of Asheville and um, specifically work with our business and public technology team. And I mention the name because we have a real focus on the public technology. And about just over three years ago, we um, launched this thing called the Asheville app, which I'll get into in just a second. But that was also about the same time that we, our team within the city IT department switched from, we used to be called GIS and application services, and we intentionally rebranded ourselves as business and public technology with a real focus on business needs of, of the city, but also on the public side. So really focused on public technology and getting the citizens to be more engaged in government and actually help us govern. Um, and so it's not coincidental that we launched the Asheville app at about that same time. And I got to give credit um, to a lot of people, but um, Jonathan Feldman, our CIO, was kind of instrumental in that. Uh, a former colleague, Dave Michelson, out here, who I'm surprised to see on a Friday morning. Um, sorry, Dave. Um, he was also uh, very instrumental in in, um, in helping us move into this public technology uh, direction. So with that, let me just dive in and talk about uh, what the Asheville app is. It's uh, The name doesn't really tell you a whole lot. So um, there's these systems out there that are often referred to as uh, uh, customer relationship management, or in the, in the public space, we call it citizen relationship management or, or 311 systems. Historically, people there was a, a lot of places had a 311 system where you or a call center where you dial 311 and you could uh, report stuff or ask, ask questions. And sure enough, at the city of Asheville, we've got such a customer service support um, group and they're open Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, and you can call that number. You can call them right now, and they, uh, they will take your question and answer whatever, you've got, whatever you want to know about Asheville. Um, mostly what they deal with is utility billing. Uh, we have a water utility, so people call in about their accounts. they got to pay a bill. They need to make payment arrangements, whatever. So that's most of what they have to handle. But they also handle any sort of service request. So if somebody is reporting um, a pothole or uh, graffiti that they want to get addressed, they would also call that number. So with the launch of the Asheville app, we sort of made this more public focused and specifically it's self-service. And that's kind of what we're all about with our uh, public technology team. So now uh, either through the website or this is just an iOS app, um, our citizens can engage with us 24-7, 365. If they see an issue they want to get resolved, they can do it uh, using this app. Um, they can also not just make a request, but they can learn about what other people are requesting. So um, you'll notice there's this nearby request. So you can click on there and just see whatever whatever might be happening in your neighborhood, for example. Um, or you can uh, put out a new request. So it just makes it really simple for people to, uh, to interface with the government. So just real quickly how this works, I'll just run through, like, if you're a citizen and you're out uh, walking down the street and you see a water leak or – as a couple of months ago, I was out to lunch with a colleague and walking downtown and a car had run into a bike rack and the bike rack was all crunched. And I said, hold on a second, let me report this. And she, she had no idea what I was doing. And I just pulled out my phone, pulled up the Asheville app. Um, there was a, uh, there's 25 different categories. So you choose a category, uh, that's most relevant, or there's a general question category if you can't find that. Um, so you choose your category. It, with your phone, it'll just use the location services and it'll, it'll know right where you are and, and mark it on the map, or you can manually do that as well. So you do that. You can snap a photo. So I snapped a picture of that uh, bike rack that was crunched and just hit submit request. And there's some other details you can put in. And these are all context specific too. So if it's a water leak, um, for example, you might, uh, there's a question in there that'll ask about is there water freezing on the road, which would create a hazard and they would want to respond much more quickly. Um, but in this case, um, with the with that bike rack issue, I just submitted it, and sure enough, within a few days, that uh, that somebody was out there to take care of it. Um, similarly, with this example here, is a pothole or or any of a number of different issues. Um, so once you actually do that, all these requests are then public. It's out there. You can go on our website today, and you can see all the public requests that have gone in. Um, this is one that was on there last month. Uh, somebody reported you down there in the bottom left. There's a description field, and the person just went online. And they just said street light not on at night, you know, simple enough. And they marked the poll ID because that was one of the uh, or the poll number, so that the, the the crews would know specifically where that light was. Marked it on the map, and um, and there's also a status with each one of these requests. So this one you can see up in the upper uh, in the middle there is completed. But when they first submit it, the person can see that it's submitted, um, and you can go through and browse and see what's out there, see what what people are requesting, how it's getting resolved. Um, it just makes a lot more transparency in terms of how we're doing business. In addition, 
it creates, unlike that call center that I talked about at the beginning, where traditionally people feel like that's like you're complaining, right? If you call that number and you and there's a street light out, you're basically calling to lodge a complaint. Why aren't, why aren't you doing a better job, city of Asheville, uh, taking care of your infrastructure? And that's probably the end of it. You make that call and you hope it gets fixed, but there's no feedback loop. There's no mechanism for you to know like who actually dealt with it, how did it get dealt with. Um, whereas when we go to something like the Asheville app, now you can actually you can do this anonymously, and a lot of people do. They don't want to take the time to create an account. But if you really want to have feedback, uh, there's quite a few folks who will create an account. Um, and so you just set up. It just requires an email address. And then when you use your phone to uh, notify the city that something needs to be fixed, um, you will get notifications back. So every time that a staff member who's dealing with that issue does something and notes it in here, you'll get a notification just saying what the status is. So in this case, Joel Tweed, who works in our public works department, he got that uh, the person who said streetlight's not working at night. He just sent a canned response, right? It's just a, and that's just to make it easy and quick. But it, it, it sets the expectation with the customer that we're going to deal with this within the next three to five days. And it might take longer. In that case, you're going to see a tag put on that light saying it's under repair. Um, but within a couple of days, it was actually fixed. And you can see the A.H. Mitch, who's the, 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 fo- the person that actually submitted this, says, hey, the light's working again. Thanks. And Joel writes back, great. Thanks for using the Asheville app. So it creates this two-way dialogue um, that lets citizens know that their voices are being heard, right? It just creates uh, the ability for, for, for people to talk back and forth. And, and uh, it, it really does promote this idea of public technology, using technology to empower citizens, not just to have to complain, but m- most folks who use this actually describe their, their interactions as um, being part of the solution. Like they're actually part of government. And that's what we want. We want people to feeling like they're engaged citizens and they can uh, help resolve problems uh, in the community. So just to give you a little idea, I, I went back and just ran a quick report to see this, how is this thing getting used? And so it's, it's, uh, we haven't done a terribly large amount of marketing with this, but we're starting to. We've done some, and you can see the growth. We've had uh, about 10,000 service requests that have come in over three years, but each year it's growing, and that's, that's a good sign. At the same time, I contacted that customer support center and asked them, hey, what's your, what's, what are your customer service calls looking like? And interestingly, there's, at least in terms of volume, there's a, there's a somewhat comparable decline in customer service calls. I can't say that there's a direct correlation there. It could be for any of a number of reasons, but it is interesting to note that the customer service calls are going down. Obviously, those billing questions and stuff, that's going to continue. But at least in terms of dealing with potholes, dealing with graffiti, or any of a number of other issues, and like I said, there's like 25 of them out there that uh, that folks can report um, now, those are uh, more and more getting resolved via the Asheville app, which is what we want. Um, And being GIS people for the most part, this is exciting stuff because not only are we talking to people, working with folks, and letting them know their voice is being heard, but we are also suddenly uh, getting data, right? Data's, I'm seeing lights in people's eyes. Like this is what this is what we live for, right? Is data. We like to have data to help uh, help us make better decisions. So now we've got this information, and this is all collected in a database. We know uh, what was what was done, when it was done, how long it took to get resolved, and we also have um, some data on what are the most common requests uh, being handled. And interestingly, there's a huge spike. It's graffiti. Um, and if you didn't know the context of Asheville, you might think that's crazy. Like, why does why are there 3,500 graffiti uh, cleanup requests in a city our size? Uh, compared to everything else, which really tapers off, you know, under a thousand requests um, each. And, and general question is a big one, actually. A lot of people just don't they, they don't even look for a specific category. They'll send it into a general question. But each one of these has a work group behind it. So some of these will go to our public works department. Some will go to the water department. Um, some will go um, to our transit, our bus service. And they go. To, so when someone submits a request, it doesn't go through a generic call center and have to be routed and take additional steps. Now it just gets direct, directly routed to the staff that's responsible, um, so they can start to address it uh, directly. Now, so you might be wondering, like, why graffiti? And I put this little this little uh, image up here: one, two, three, graffiti free. So it just so happens in 2014, the year after we launched this, um, for some reason I don't know why, uh, it was kind of the flavor of the year was graffiti. And everybody was excited about graffiti Um, and our city council and our mayor. And um, there was just a big push like we need to clean up graffiti. That's going to make Asheville a great city. So uh, so there was this big push and there was a campaign marketing and so on. 
And we specifically um, encouraged people through the media, through uh, press releases, through uh, TV interviews, a lot through social media too. We are pushing out the Asheville app saying, please use the Asheville app. If you see graffiti, report it. We'll fix it. And the city was actually uh, putting dollars behind it too to actually clean up graffiti, not just on public property, but private property too. So that, that marketing effort shows the Asheville app got a lot of use. And what it tells me is with more marketing on specific issues, we can really drive use of something like this. Um, but we have this data, and this data is open. We can, we, can, uh, we can expose it to the community and let the community start to look at um, ways to solve problems. And one thing that we did uh, actually back in 2014, so here's that, here's that graffiti data again, but um, – we were hiring a new uh, uh, software developer in the summer of 2014, and as part of that hiring assessment, we were able to use GitHub and Open Data, and we put that data set out there, and we said, hey, candidates, and we had, I think, four that we really were interested in, and we asked those four top candidates, we said, build us something, just build us a dashboard, here's an API, here's this Open Data, um, show, us that you, show us what you can do. Don't, we didn't expect a finished product, but just show us, you know, Build something on the road to awesomeness, and then if you can do that, then we'll know if we hire you, you're the kind of person we want to work with. And sure enough, uh, our top candidate, this is what we got back. Um, and it was actually, this, there was another iteration of this that he, that he delivered as part of his hiring assessment, uh, but he used the API uh, with the Asheville app. He was able to build a map showing where all these requests were taking place and the and details, as, as well as the, the dollars that the city was investing. So it's a pretty cool little dashboard that he built in a matter of a few days. And then two weeks after um, he joined us, this thing became a production app and was, was promoted all over the city and promoted among our elected officials. And everybody got really excited about it and just helped to, to drive that, that usage even further. So um, it's a great way um, – to use open data, in this case for, for hiring, but you can also use it just to put it out and let the community um, explore these issues like graffiti or, or any of a number of things and, uh, and start to build solutions and do, uh, do great things. But it requires that you actually make this data available and provide an API access um, so people can actually interact with it. So for example, um, we have a uh, – I've been involved with Code for Asheville, a brigade of Code for America, Civic Technology Group. And they're always – well, regularly we hold events uh, where we bring members of the community together around different issues. It might be around transportation um, or around housing or any of a number of things. Um, and by providing open data sets, we have civic technologists, folks in the community that just start building cool stuff. And we don't necessarily have to uh, even know about it in some cases. Like there's a – at the very – one of the early slides, there was a, a find parking uh, link off the Asheville app where you can find parking uh, anywhere in, in Asheville's parking garages. And that was – there was a find parking app was built by a member of the community without us even knowing about it, just because we put the data out there and said, go crazy, you know, build stuff. And, and, and that thing gets used now and, and it just bringing extra value to the city without us even having to deal with it. That's like, for me, um, the true magic of open data and, and this whole civic tech uh, um, bring it all together. But it also allows us as an agency to, or as a, as a city to start making better decisions because unlike that call center where the data is kind of hard to aggregate and hard to use, now we've got data directly in the database. So this took me about a minute just to throw this up. I had I just picked an issue. I picked potholes. So these are potholes from 2016. I just threw a filter in here. And right away you can start to uh, just look at least at some trends. Like we're all about spatial trends in the GIS community. So if you look over there on the left in West Asheville, this area in particular, it just it sort of surprised me. Like there's some spikes there, 81 potholes uh, in, one, in one little area, 28 potholes in another. And I sort of drove in a little bit deeper and noticed there was 22 potholes on a single street that were fixed in 2016. Just knowing this, being able to visualize this quickly and easily can help us as a, as a city – make better decisions. For example, we might just want to resurface that street because obviously it's a chronically, it's a, it's a street in chronic need, right? Um, but then there's deeper questions. Like we're, we are now starting a process in Asheville around equity, specifically around racial equity and around um, uh, folks that are economically dis disadvantaged and making sure that we're providing the same level of support and services to folks of, you know, of every community in Asheville, no matter where you live. And one of the really awesome things about public technology and about something like the Asheville app is it really democratizes access to services. 
So no longer is it somebody that can get off work between 9 and 5 to either make that call or come to City Hall and get something addressed. They can pull out their phone over the weekend, whenever, whenever and, actually, and, and, and lodge an issue to get resolved. And in this case, with those 22 potholes on that one street, that happens to be one of the poorest streets in the entire city. And I haven't dug into this much deeper. I just happened to dig, I, I just found this in putting these slides together and doing a little quick research. But that's Grenada Street. It's it's one of the uh, like most economically distressed just distressed areas of Asheville, and it's just interesting that now folks have access to this technology. Most folks have smartphones, even in a, even in poorer communities, p folks have access to some technology, and you can see they're using it, and it empowers people to actually make a difference and get their neighborhood improved in this case, right? They're getting these potholes fixed. So um, that I, I doubt that was the case if it was required the sort of traditional logic complaint formally through a, a call center. So I'm particularly excited to see things like that. Um, seeing, But it also, in terms of the question of equity, we can just verify that indeed we are providing services throughout the city, through all of our neighborhoods. It's not just the, the folks that have the personal relationships with city council members who can call up and say, fix something on my street. Now everybody's got access to this and it's all tracked. So um, just some exciting stuff. So in terms of overall benefits of a CRM system like the Asheville app, Definitely about more engaged citizenry. That's probably the biggest thing for us is having citizens that can take part in government and participate. And it's open to everybody. It's, it's, it's blind to anybody's circumstances. It's open and equal to everyone. Um, it allows us to provide better customer service in terms of just 24-7 access. It also allows more accountability from the standpoint that now – with each one of those service requests, there's a service level agreement that we've established with those. So, for example, with the street light going out, a citizen can expect within five days that's going to get addressed. Well, now we know not only when the request was, was uh, posted, but we know when it was fixed, when our staff went in and actually fixed it. So suddenly we've got data and we can start to see where are we exceeding expectations and maybe we're, where are we falling short and why. And it may not be the staff's fault. Maybe we're understaffed in certain departments. And this could help us actually start to see those trends and make changes in terms of how we're uh, addressing problems across the city. And, and sort of related to that is just being able to make more data-driven decisions. I think that's, that's, uh, that's a key thing that we can all be doing. So next steps, uh, we just recently, we're trying to improve this, not just for the citizens. We feel like the, the public side is actually pretty good and fairly easy to use. And like you, you saw, the, there is growth. We do want to push more marketing and uh, make sure that everybody in the city knows about this and has access to it. And that's just uh, some of it's word of mouth, but also it's a lot of social media marketing. Um, but from the, from the, um, from the uh, staff side, it's also important that this work really well. And so we knew that there were some problems. We heard some grumblings among staff. So we, we, we put out a survey and started doing interviews with our own staff to figure out, like, how's this working for you? How's it not working for you? And one of the biggest things is that better systems integration. It's really easy to throw a system out there. But what uh, the reality is, is this is essentially like a work order tracking system, right? But when somebody reports a water leak, that water leak gets reported to our water department, who then has to open up a... Um, go into their own work order system and open up uh, a, a case and work through that. And then when that gets resolved, they got to remember to come back to the Asheville app and actually close it out. That's just bad technology right there. I mean, it's just bad design. So we are working closely with the different departments because we have a, a handful of different work order systems throughout the city. All of those need to be tightly integrated with two-way communication. And that's what we're working. That's our next goal is to get that all established so that staff don't even have, they can work in their native systems and that day. And when they put, uh, updates, that'll get pushed directly to the Asheville app and notified back to the resident. Um, also, consistency among staff. We've had some struggles with this. We've got, you know, 50 different people using this app uh, internally, and some folks are great with customer service, like Joel Tweed, you saw there, uh, was, you know, he, he was very respectful and, and, and responsive to the, to the citizen. But we've seen some cases, and, um, you know, it's just because you've got so many people doing this and not a lot of, um, there's just there's not been probably enough training, but uh, one example that I remember seeing uh, early on was somebody reported a pothole, and the response was, that's the county, period, closed, and they completed the request. And so that, that citizen gets back as soon as it says, that's the county. Like, what does that mean? They don't care. They just want the pothole fixed. They don't really care if it's a city street or a county street or a DOT street. They just want it fixed. So now we're working with, with the folks um, on staff to make sure that, they, first of all, they got canned responses so they can be consistent in the messaging. But 
one of those responses would be this uh, this street is maintained by Buncombe County. The number for that for, for for that public works department is such and such, and we've went ahead and notified them of this. But you can follow up that with them for more details because they won't it won't get closed out through the Asheville app. But at least we're taking the step to get people pushed in the right direction and not putting the onus on the citizen to have to just deal with the ridiculous nature of arbitrary lines with government. So that's something we that we should be particularly those of us in the public sector should be uh, more adept at handling. So. Um, Ultimately, though, our goal in all of this with public technology is to have delighted citizens. Like, uh, and maybe that's a big goal, but I don't think it's too much to ask that we have delighted citizens. And this is an email that we got, uh, I think it was last year, um, from a citizen who wrote our city manager and city council. And uh, you can read it, but it, 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 it speaks to what we're trying to achieve. Uh, essentially, there was a pothole in this neighborhood and uh, this person wrote in to say that it's unbelievable experience with the Asheville app. They've been driving over this pot hill for a year, threatening to swallow their car. They cursed it every day. And then they heard about the Asheville app actually on a news story. I didn't put the whole email in here, but they heard about it on a, on a news story, downloaded it, went out, took a picture, reported it. And within 48 hours, that pothole was fixed. That's the kind of government service that we can really be proud of. And that when our citizens get that kind of service, they cheer us on. And 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 it, and it just makes you it makes it feel great to work in the public service when you can actually deliver those kind of results and um, and delight people in the process. So with that, I'll happily entertain any questions. Yes. So the question is, what's the plan for development for expanding? Um, So there's not uh, – the scope of this really is citizen service requests. So if there were other request types that we weren't already handling in this, we might branch that out. There is some flexibility. Like we were able to uh, – the parking question was one that came up. And so um, way back – I'll just go back to the beginning here. Um, there is this uh, fine parking. We, so we can add a few things in here. But part of it – part of the goal here too is not to clutter this up too much but – kind of keep it focused. Like the whole idea here is to let citizens be engaged, let them participate. If you see a problem, if you're walking your dog and you see uh, a, a street sign got knocked over, pull out your phone and report it. And suddenly, instead of having, you know, a, a limited number of, of city staff dealing with problems, we like to think that suddenly we're, we're engaging thousands of citizens to work with us, you know, sort of hand in hand to solve problems. So the scope of this is, I think, intentionally limited. Um, so that it gets used and, and we don't create confusion. But yeah, fair question. There, I think what we are doing though is looking at other ways to, like other channels aside from the actual app to uh, to engage citizens. And we're doing stuff like like open town hall process where you know we can have communications on issues and, and folks can log in and give their opinions on just issues or something that city council is looking to uh, to adopt, things like that. And then the open data program is another play, place where we're really trying to engage with folks. Yeah. Yep. So the question was, there's a lot of third-party apps out there, um, like C-Click Fix is one. There's a whole bunch of them, actually. And would we have developed this, or, or would we consider using an off-the-shelf product? Um, so... I was intentionally not trying to make this a commercial, um, but this is an off-the-shelf product. So this is one of many that are out there. Um, I, and, I mean, just full disclosure, it's public stuff is the company. They are actually were bought by Accela. Uh, but there's plenty of them out there. C-Click Fix is another one that's used. But you can brand these things for your agency. So, um, no, I totally would uh, encourage you not to build something from scratch that is readily available and affordable Um and there's plenty of vendors out there that make nice products. So, yes. So the question is, given the data that we've collected, has it changed our resource allocation in terms of budgeting and personnel? 
that is just something we're starting to look at now. It has not, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, but I think it's, it's going to, I think, well, it'll either validate the budgeting and personnel decisions that are already out there, or it'll help us to make some changes. But, um, but that's, that's one of the things we want to be starting to use this data for. We're feeling like just getting enough data to start doing that kind of thing. So it's a great question. Anybody else? Well, again, thanks for your, uh, your uh, attention on a Friday morning. And if anybody wants to chat, we'll be around. So thanks. <laughs>